Hi everyone. So we are going to start our read aloud today. This is the book that you guys picked, No Fixed Address by Susan Nielsen. And we're going to read the first 20 pages. So just listen um, and follow along because you'll have a question or two to answer um, at the end. And this is what we'll kind of do every Wednesday. And we'll try and fit it in as much during regular class time as we can. All right, so our book starts off on November 27th at 12.05 a.m. So that's five minutes past midnight. My leg jiggled up and down. I shifted from one bum cheek to the other. My palms felt damp and my heart was pounding. I've never been interrogated before. You're not being interrogated, Felix. We're just having a chat. Are you going to record it? Why would I do that? It's how they do it on TV. We're not on TV. The cold from the metal chair seeped through my pajama bottoms. Do cops watch cop shows? Of course. But isn't that like bringing your work home with you? Constable Lee smiled. Her teeth were very straight. My powers of observation, or POO, told me that she came from a middle-class family, one that could afford an orthodontist. My POO also told me that she enjoyed food. The buttons on her uniform were strained to the max. Not really, she answered. It's escapism for us, too, and we get to shout at the TV if they're doing something totally bogus. Like what? Like record this type of conversation. We only record a conversation if someone's been charged with a crime or is suspect in a crime. Are you recording Astrid right now? I can't answer that. Oh, boy. I hardly ever cry, but all of a sudden I thought I might burst into tears right in front of a cop. I think she could tell because she added, I highly doubt it. I breathed in, I breathed out, I sat up straight, I tried to look calm and dignified even though I knew my blonde curls were sticking out in all directions, because until everything went so terribly wrong, I'd been in bed. Plus, I was wearing my ancient minions pajamas, which were juvenile and way too small. Constable Lee and her partner hadn't given us time to change. I'd like to call my lawyer, I said. Let me guess, you got that from TV too? Yes. Do you have a lawyer? No, but legally I'm allowed one, right? Except you don't need one. You haven't done anything wrong. So I could just leave? I suppose, but where would you go? I thought about Dylan and Winnie. Then I remembered that I told them I never wanted to see them again. When will they be done talking to Astrid? Soon, I'm sure. She stared at me, clicking her pen, open and shut, open, shut. Mind if I ask why you don't call her mom? She says it's too higher, too much hierarchy. I scanned the room full of desks and a handful of people for the hundredth time and for the hundredth time I didn't spot Astrid. It'll be okay, I thought messaged her because she's always telling me that she'll receive anything I send to her. I don't want to believe that anymore. I don't believe that anymore, but under the circumstances, it was worth a shot. For the record, I said to Constable Lee, Astrid is a great parent. Good to know. She tapped on her keyboard. I'm going to ask you a few questions, okay? Okay. Let's start with your full name. Felix Frederick Knutson. She typed it into her computer. Age? 13. Well, almost. 12 and 3 quarters. Mom's full name? Astrid Anna Knutson. Address? I looked down at my feet. I wore my rubber boots, no socks. There hadn't been time to search for a pair. Constable Lee leaned towards me. Her shoulders were rounded. She didn't have good posture. When we answered your call tonight, Felix, it did appear as if you were both living there. Oh, how I longed for my mom. She would have a plausible-sounding explanation, but I'm not like her. I'm not a natural-born stretcher of the truth. So I continued to stare at the floor. Constable Lee started typing, even though I hadn't said a word. Felix, she said gently, you can talk to me. I'm hungry. Of course, I should have asked. She pushed, her, pushed herself up from her desk and hitched her pants up around her belly. We're talking vending machine snacks. Hope that's okay. Any allergies? Any preferences? No allergies, no preferences, although I am partial to anything cheese-flavored. Constable Lee walked across the big room. I glanced around. A couple of cops were at their desks. One was reading Popular Mechanics and another one was dozing. I swiveled Constable Lee's computer screen towards me. It was an official-looking report. Name, Felix Frederick Knutson, age 12, parent guardian, Astrid Anna Knutson, address, NFA, I'm pretty good at figuring out acronyms, and this one, given the context, came to me right away. No fixed address. I felt a, repl a ripple of dread. Astrid had warned me over and over, no one can find out where we live. And until tonight, I'd only broken that rule once. Our cover was blown. I tried to tell myself it wasn't my fault. I had no choice. I had to call the cops. If I hadn't, who knows what would have happened. 
but still the bad guys got away. And who was at the police station? The innocent victims, us. The two bag of cheesies landed on the desk in front of me along with a can of Coke. Aren't we a nosy Parker, Constable Lee said as she swiveled the computer screen back. No one can agree on the origin of that expression, I said. Some people think it came from an archbishop in the 1500s named Parker who asked too many questions. Other people think that's hooey since the phrase didn't appear till the end of the 19th century. I knew I was rambling, but I couldn't help it. You are a font of knowledge. My mom says I store facts like a squirrel stores nuts. Constable Lee tore open a bag of chips and popped one in her mouth. Now you have to believe me when I say I'm here to help. I wanted to believe her, but I kept thinking of my mom, who snorted like a pig whenever a police car drove by, who liked to say, never trust the man. Which man, I'd asked when I was younger. The man. It's an expression. It means any man or woman who's in a position of authority. So all I said to Constable Lee was, thanks, but we don't need any help. Really? Really? We'll be moving very soon. Yeah, where? I don't know yet, but I'm coming into some money. The only question is, how much? An inheritance? No. Selling some valuables? No. Robbing a bank? Very funny, but no. So where's this money coming from? A game show, I said. Well, now I'm intrigued. Tell me more. About the show? Constable Lee put her feet up on her desk. About everything. I studied her face. My P.O.O. told me that she was a decent person. Maybe if she knew the truth, she would see that we had done nothing wrong. So I poured a bunch of cheesies down my throat. Then I told Constable Lee the whole truth and nothing but the truth. A brief history of our homes. There's nice little pictures on the chapter titles, too. We haven't always lived in a van. That only started about four months ago. B.V., before van. We lived in a 400-square-foot basement. Before that, we lived in a 600-square-foot apartment. Before that, we actually owned an 800-square-foot condo. And before that, we lived with Mormore. Mormore's house. Mormore means mother, mother's mother in Swedish. She was my grandma. Astrid and I lived with her in a bungalow in New Westminster, just outside of Vancouver, until I was seven. Her house was crammed full of knickknacks from Sweden. She must have had 50 red and blue wooden Dalarna horses. She also had a big tomed collection. Tomtar, plural for tomed, are mischievous gnome-like creatures in Swedish folklore. They watch over you and protect your family, but if you don't treat them with respect, they can also be cruel. They might play a trick on you or steal your things or even kill your farm animals. More more gave me my own on my fifth birthday. She'd made it herself out of felt. He was four inches tall with a long white beard, a red cone-shaped hat, and a red jacket. Your own protector, she said. I named him Mel. More more looked after me when Astrid was at work. My mom had two jobs back then. She taught an evening painting class in Vancouver at Emily Carr University, and she answered phones in an insurance office. Once I saved enough, she'd say to me, we'll get our own place. She didn't like living with more more. But I did. She took me to the park in the mornings, and in the afternoons I played imaginary games like Pirate Ship and Fort and Outer Space while she watched her shows. Drew, Maury, Ellen, Phil, Judge Judy, the women of The View, they all felt like friends. And I have more and more to thank for introducing me to Who, What, Where, When with Horatio Blass. It was her favorite show, and it quickly became mine, too. More and more was what, it's, was what was called a Lutheran. And she read me Bible stories, but it had to be our little secret because Astrid said organized religion was the cause of all the world's woes, and she'd broken up with the church a long time ago. We made Swedish gingerbread, and more and more let me eat the balls of dough. At nap time, she let me curl up on her cushiony lap and doze while she watched TV. When I had just turned six, I woke up from one of those naps to find more and more was sleeping too. This was not unusual. She often took a mid-afternoon snooze, so when I got up to play quietly on the floor with my train set, which had belonged to my mom and her brother when they were little. After an hour or so, when Mormor still hadn't woken up, I gave her a tiny poke. Her head slumped further down onto her chest. Her skin was gray and cold to the touch. I noticed a dark stain underneath her. It was wet. I started to giggle, delighted. Mormor, you peed your pants! Up to that moment, I had been the only one in our household to pee their pants. But she didn't answer me. More and more? I knew something wasn't right, but I was little. I had not fully developed my P.O.O. I called my mom, and she called 9-1 home and came straight home. There was nothing anyone could do. I miss more and more a lot, and I know my mom did too. For months afterward, I slept in Astrid's room, and I brought Mel in every night so he could watch over us while we slept. I wasn't taking any chances. Our brief brush with homeownership. 
Mormor left everything to my mom. It wasn't much because it wasn't as much as Astrid hoped it would be because Mormor had wired some of her savings to a Nigerian prince. But when Astrid sold the house a year after Mormor's death, we had enough to put a down payment on a brand new condominium in Kitsilano on the west side of Vancouver. Even though I miss Mormor, I loved our new place. It was small, but it was ours. The chemical aroma of fresh carpet was still in the air. Everything sparkled with newness. Astrid hung her bold canvases everywhere. We ate my favorite foods for supper, like grilled cheese with pickles and fish sticks with peas. I started third grade at Waterloo Public School, and soon I had not just a friend, but a best friend. Dylan Binkerhoff and I hung out all the time, playing with Legos and reading books like Lip Ripley's Believe It or Not and Grossology and wrote articles about UFO sightings and poltergeists. Astrid got another job answering phones at a TV production company, and Emily Carr, where she still taught two nights a week, was just a short bus drive away. But a year and a half after we moved in, two things started to happen. Number one, Astrid lost both her jobs. It wasn't anything she'd done, not this time. Her evening classes didn't get enough enrollment for another semester, so it was canceled. And the production company she worked for went bankrupt. Number two, our building started to sink. Yeah, sink. It had been built on top of what used to be a riverbed. The condo owners were on the hook for the repairs, which were going to cost $40,000 each. We didn't have $40,000. We clung to the place for another year, but finally Astrid had to sell it at a loss. Then we had the two-bedroom rental. Really, it was a one-bedroom plus a den. We could hear our neighbors fighting and the carpet smelled funky, but overall it wasn't too bad. It was on the east side near Commercial Drive, which meant I had to switch schools in the middle of the year. I didn't make any close friends, but on the plus side, I didn't make any enemies either. I missed Dylan a lot. We had a few visits, but Astrid didn't own a car, and I was too young to take the bus alone. That meant Dylan's parents had to do all the driving, and they had two other kids with busy schedules. So after a few months, we lost touch. Astrid couldn't afford an couldn't find a office or teaching job, so she got her first waitressing job on the drive. I had to spend quite a few evenings on my own, but I had my imagination in my library books, and I watched some of the shows more and more and I used to enjoy together, like who, what, where, and when. One night, Astrid came home early. She was fuming. This customer kept trying to feel my butt. Astrid had always been a firm believer in talking to me like an equal. Yet I'm the one who gets punished, just because I threw my drink in his face so he'd stop. Then I understood why she got fired. We fell behind on the rent, but lucky for us, Astrid became friends with Yuri, the building superintendent, and he cut us some slack. A few times a week, she would make him dinner and go downstairs to his apartment for a couple of hours. I guess he was sort of her boyfriend, even though he never took her out on a proper date. Then Astrid met Abelard. She stopped visiting Yuri's apartment. I guess Yuri felt hurt because he stuck an eviction notice on our door. We moved again to a one-bedroom basement close to Boundary Road. That meant another new school. It was harder this time. Most of the other kids had been together since kindergarten, and they didn't need a new friend. What the heck's in your gene pool? A tall, pinched-looking girl named Marcia asked me one day. Half Swedish, 25% Haitian, 25% French, I replied. Add it all up, and that equals 100% Canadian. She pursed her lips. You look like a clown. It wasn't the first time someone had made fun of my hair. When I was younger, I wanted Mom to cut it all off, but she'd refused. Now I'm glad she didn't. It's part of who I am. I'm like Samson before he met Delilah. It's my superpower, and Astrid loves my hair. She says it reminds her of her two favorite singers, Nan and Art Garfunkel. She says it's good to have a distinct feature, and most of the time I agree. So I put up with idiots like Marsha right up to the end of sixth grade. But I didn't like that school. I didn't like our basement apartment either. It smelled musty, and even on sunny days, it was dark. Plus, Abelard was there all the time. Astrid managed to get another office job at BC Hydro, but that one didn't last either. She told me they laid some people off, and since she was the last in, she was the first out. But from stuff I overheard, I think it was more than that. I think she got lippy with her supervisor. I don't suffer fools gladly, I heard her say to Abelard. That guy was such a fool. Two weeks after that, Abelard broke up with her, which brings me to the Westphalia. The van belonged to Abelard. My mom met him at a day-long meditation retreat. He was the instructor, or guru. Astrid is still pretty, even though she's 44. She's tall and slender and has long, wavy blonde hair. 
I've seen men's heads turn as she walks down the street. So even though Abelard was 10 years younger, he asked my mom out for coffee after the retreat, and from that moment on, they were inseparable. When we moved to the basement apartment, he pretty much moved in too, parking his Westphalia out front. Abelard reminded me of Jesus, but only in looks. He had long brown hair, a hipster beard, and a mustache. He said he was a Buddhist, and he blathered on about peace and love and tolerance, which would have been fine if he wasn't such a dink. First of all, he mooched off my mom, and even though it was obvious that we had barely had enough to make ends meet. And second of all, he had a bad temper. He'd swear at my mom because she threw his yoga pants in the dryer instead of letting them drip dry, or because she'd accidentally interrupted one of his meditation sessions. He was an angry Buddhist, and I couldn't stand him. One night in July, Abelard told Astrid that he was headed to India on a spiritual journey and that he couldn't be tethered to her anymore. They fought. I left the apartment and walked around the block ten times. On the one hand, I felt bad for Astrid because I knew she liked Abelard. On the other hand, I was relieved. She deserved so much better. By the time I returned, Abelard was gone, but his Westphalia wasn't. It was still in the driveway. Astrid told me that Abelard had gifted it to her, his small way of thanking her for him being such a freeloader. Now I'm finding out that Abelard has accused us of stealing the van. I know my mom sometimes embellishes the truth, but any thinking person would be nuts to take Abelard at his word because that guy's a snake. My best guess is that the truth lies somewhere in the middle, but I'm getting ahead of myself. A week after Abelard left for India, the landlord changed our locks. He'd been trying to get us out for a while because we were behind on our rent. We came home to find our belongings stacked on the front lawn. My gerbil Horatio sat on top of the pile in his cage. Horatio had been my 10th birthday present. I'd really wanted a dog, so at first I was disappointed when Astrid gave me a rodent. But when I looked into his beady little eyes and petted his soft black and white fur, I fell in love. Even though he couldn't fetch or run or do tricks, even though we had a brain the size of a peanut, I loved him. So when I saw him perched precariously on the top of our stuff, I lost it. What if his cage had fallen and he had been hurt? What if the door hadn't been securely fastened and he'd escaped? What if a hungry dog had come along? Horatio didn't look traumatized, but then again, it's hard to read complex emotions on a gerbil's face. I started to cry, loudly. Astrid wrapped me in a big hug. It's okay, Lilligubbin, it's okay. Lilligubbin is one of her pet names for me. It also means little old man in Swedish. Apparently, when I was born, that's exactly what I looked like, bald and wrinkly. How is it okay, I wailed. We have nowhere to live. She gripped my shoulders and made me look at her. Don't you worry, I'll figure something out. I always do. And that brings me to... So Leal's house. Astrid started phoning friends to see if someone could put us up for a few nights. My POO has taught me over the years that my mom is really good at making friends and even better at losing them. So I wasn't super surprised when Ingrid said no or when Karen hung up on her. Astrid thought for a moment. Then she'd said, I'll try So Leal. So Leal was one of Astrid's students in her painting class at Emily Carr, a fellow mom. They'd become fast friends and then two years ago they had a huge fight. I heard the whole thing from my bedroom. It started out as a celebration because Solil had sold another painting, this time for a record amount. But after they'd finished a second bottle of wine, Astrid started talking about the mediocrity of the masses and how she couldn't understand why boring, bland work like Solil's was selling while her superior abstract paintings weren't. Solil left in tears and they didn't speak again until now. She says we can stay with her for a bit, Astrid said when she got off the phone. She looked just as surprised as I did. We packed everything into the Westphalia and drove to Salil's new house near Main Street in King Edward. She was waiting for us in the driveway of a big modern home when we pulled up. Astrid whistled quietly. Someone's moved up in the world. Salil smiled when she saw me. She's tall and broad-shouldered with a friendly face. Felix, you've grown so much. Then she gave my mom a lukewarm hug. Astrid, how are you? What happened? Last minute, uh, renoviction by a scumbag landlord. I almost had to admire how effortlessly the lies rolled off her tongue. Salil helped us carry everything into a bright, spacious basement. A painting of yellow roses hung on one wall. I remember that, said Astrid. You painted that at Emily Carr. And you told me it was technically fine, but emotionally dead. You didn't think I was living up to my full potential. Astrid's silence filled the room. I watched Salil's pale skin turn pink. My rose paintings have become my best sellers. I can't seem to keep up with the demand. My POO told me when we were headed into a dangerous territory. Would you like to pet my gerbil, I asked, but Astrid spoke before Salil could answer. I'm happy for you, Salil. I really am. 
I breathed a sigh of relief until she added, your work is perfect for corporate lobbies and boardrooms. Oh boy. Salil wound her arms tightly across her chest. Arpad's parents are arriving at the end of the week, but you're welcome to stay until then, she said. Uh, you didn't mention that before, Astrid said. Well, I'm mentioning it now, said Salil, her gaze fixed on the yellow roses. Salil and her family had plans for the evening, so Astrid and I walked over to Helen's Grill and ordered the all-day breakfast for supper. I felt anxious not having a place to live. Can do that to a person. The waitress brought us our plates. Why do breakfast foods always taste better at dinner? Astrid asked. It's a scientific mystery, I said. We ate in silence for a while. Then Astrid said, I have a fun idea. I looked at her, my mouth full of scrambled eggs. We'll live in the van! Just for a few weeks until I find another place. Think about it, Felix. It'll be the ultimate summer vacation. The freedom, the adventure. My favorite book when I was 19 was On the Road by Jack Kerak. It'll be a blast. I thought about it. The farthest I've ever traveled was to Victoria. My entire class had visited the provincial parliament buildings when I was 10. Marcia had pulled my hair on the bus the whole way there and the whole way back. Could we travel? Go across BC? Or maybe as far as the Rockies? Of course! Can we afford it? For a month? Yes, I have some savings. If you have savings, why'd we fall behind on the rent? Astrid popped a strip of bacon into her mouth. The landlord was gouging us. The number of times I asked him to repair things that never got fixed, he owed us a few months rent-free for the crap we put up with. Oh. So what do you say? Ultimate summer vacation? I wasn't convinced, but I didn't want to be a party pooper. I guess so, sure. We high-fived to seal the deal, and that brings me to the beginning of August, to the day we started living in the van. We'll stop there for today. We'll pick up in August next time we read.